My guest on the podcast today is artist and writer John Joe McFadden. Now, most recently, have written Life on the Edge, The Coming Age of Quantum Biology, and many other books now before that. I'm talking Quantum Evolution, many times over, another book called Human Nature, uh, Fact and Fiction, uh, and more on quantum evolution, something I want to get deeper, much deeper into on this opening, but um, it's hard to really give uh, enough credit to the mind-opening authorship of which John Joe offers in all of his books. So uh, the most I can do is just tell you what he does for a living. And he's a professor of molecular genetics at the University of Surrey and is an editor of several leading textbooks for over a decade, specialized in examining tuberculosis, meningitis, inventing the first successful molecular test for the latter. He is the author of Quantum Evolution, the co-editor of Human Nature, Fact and Fiction. John Joe McFadden, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, I was thrilled uh, when you agreed to do the show because we've had uh, Dr. Jack Cruz on multiple times and uh, he is very quick to reference and give credit to uh, uh, your authorship and kind of a, a waking up period for him. Uh, and so to have you on the show it was thrilling. And I know the listeners as well as myself. So, again, uh, I'm deeply grateful for doing the show and, and sharing what you know. OK, it's a pleasure. Um, I, I kind of like I like to learn about the person sometimes before I try to extract as much competence as I possibly can from uh, whoever comes on the show. So uh, if you don't mind, can you kind of tell me a little bit about your background, your come, where you come from and kind of your path maybe toward quantum biology? Yeah, sure. Um, well, where I come from uh, is originally Ireland, actually. I was born in uh, in the Republic of Ireland uh, many years ago, uh, but my family um, moved, emigrated to uh, England back in the 1960s. And I grew up in um, in a town in the middle of England called Coventry. And um, um, one of the kind of industrial towns of, uh, of central England. And um, at, uh, at the University of, of London in, uh, uh, um, in London, obviously, and, um, and then uh, from biochemistry, I went uh, on to microbiology. And how I came to uh, quantum biology was a rather odd route, actually. Um, in the 19... Um, I can't remember the dates right now, but there was a very odd uh, phenomenon being described in microbiology called adaptive mutations. So I was a microbial genetic... I examined the genes in, in microbes and how they um, evolved and um, and things like mutations were very interesting and uh, uh, important to my research. Um, mutations, for example, that cause uh, bacteria to become resistant to drugs. So mutations were uh, important and, um, and interesting. And uh, a chap called uh, uh, Cairns, John Cairns, uh, discovered something rather odd that uh, certain kinds of mutations became more common when they provided an advantage to the bacteria that uh, uh, caused uh, some kinds of disease. And this was very odd because everyone thought that mutations ought to be completely random, that they should happen. Um, mutations are caused by usually physical um, injuries of some kind to cells, such as radiation or heat or many other kinds of, uh, of uh, stresses on a cell. And they sh shouldn't really know where they're going. You know, radiation will just hit the DNA, the genes, anywhere in the genome. Um, so they should be random. And yet these bacteria were appearing to be able to mutate some genes that... Um, uh, that were required for their growth. It was the way this experiment was, the bacteria weren't able to grow unless they acquired a mutation. And they then acquired that mutation a lot more frequently than they highly random. And this was a big puzzle in microbiology circles and in fact genetic circles in in, in the whole uh, um, biology, really, it's very odd, very fundamental to biology. The, 
they're fundamental to evolution. They're they're driving force for evolution. They generate the variation. Try, we're evolution. trying to answer the question: Why? Why? Why do we push on? Why to mutate? Why to evolve? Why to grow? How are we doing? Exactly. That? Well, well, the why in standard evolutionary theory is that there's no why. It's just random. Variations occur no particular reason. It's just random to appear more frequently. I did an advantage suggesting that the bacteria had some way of of causing certain mutations to happen more than others. Very, very odd. And anyway, I was reading at the time um, John Gribbin's Owen Schrodinger's um, Cat, uh, a very good popular science uh, book about quantum mechanics. It was the first time I read anything about quantum mechanics. Everyone, at the time, I think people know a little bit more about quantum mechanics. But if you were interested in science in the 1980s and 90s, you probably knew about relativity, Einstein's theory of special re relativity, black holes, and all that kind of stuff. But quantum mechanics was still a bit kind of out there and not really understood by the side of physics. Um, and then a few books started to appear, like John Gribbin's uh, Schrodinger's Cat. And I found it mind-bendingly weird and wonderful. Uh, but it did occur to me that there may be some way in which quantum mechanics may help to account for this ability of some mutations to appear more rapidly than they should be expected. Um, I, I, I keep having this thought. I, I, excuse me, pardon the interruption. I think I was actually interrupting, but I, I had a uh, wonder when I was when you were studying the bacteria and how it would uh, grow or mutate on its own, trying to question whether something had happened. Did it do it on its own? What was the influence? Did it need a, a leg up? Was there any sign maybe of like the bacteria working together in some way to to gather no. to, to mutate? Nothing. No, no, no. There was no kind of collective decision or anything. Uh, each bacteria mutated on its own to uh, be able to grow um, by eating a sugar, glucose. Uh, another bacteria didn't, or some other did. There, it was, uh, there was no community involved in, this, in these experiments. It was just single bacteria uh, that randomly change. Sometimes they, when they make their when they copy all their genes and replicate their genome, they make mistakes. Those mistakes are called mutations. They should be random, and in this case, they didn't seem to be. So, um, so reading Schrodinger's cat, I kind of thought, hmm, maybe maybe this quantum mechanics is involved here. But I knew very little about quantum mechanics apart from what I read in John Gribbins. But I did work at a university that had a physics department, so I thought, okay, well, I'll. I'll phone someone up, and I did, and they said, hmm, sounds interesting. Why don't you come and give us a seminar? Along to the physics department, kind of as a biologist, putting my head in the lion's mouth and um, uh, and uh, give a talk on uh, a seminar uh, on this idea. And it was uh, that quantum mechanics might be involved, and it was received very, very skeptically by the audience, quite rightly. It was a pretty wacky idea. But uh, Jim Al-Khalili was in the audience, who's, um, um, you may know now, is a very uh, successful popular writer and broadcaster. But at that time, he was, like me, pretty, pretty unknown as uh, outside of uh, the university. Anyway, we got together, and uh, over a period of months, we worked out some kind of uh, scheme that we thought might account for adaptive mutations using quantum mechanics and published the paper. Can you and can was, you kind of summarize, if you will, the the uh, abstract, if you will, the question into it, and, and what you found at the end of that? Okay. Well, what we proposed in the paper was that first, uh, our platform was the realization that had been made many uh, by a, a Swedish physicist, uh, Pierre uh, Lodin. Um, that DNA is a single molecule. Well, everyone knew that. What sort of great discovered that? But that being a single molecule, quantum mechanics takes over as the rule book for that molecule. And um, when we talk about the behavior of tables, chairs, glasses, and water, you don't use quantum mechanics to find out what, what they're going to do next. When you're talking about molecules, you have to use quantum mechanics. That's the only science that describes how single molecules behave. So that came as a kind of a surprise to me that the the uh, uh, root of biology, DNA and genome, obeyed a different set of rules than the big stuff around us that we were familiar with. These rules, 
is that particles can sometimes disappear in one point of space. And appear in another. A phenomenon called something we call quantum superposition. Now, if that was happening inside DNA, then it could be, so we speculated, that DNA could be in several mutational states at the same time. That it could be sampling, if you like, or exploring lots of possible mutations, and only one of them would kind of rescue the cell from dying, essentially. These are, uh, this experiment was performed on cells that were dying and would otherwise die unless they acquired this mutation. And that provided a huge kind of pressure for the cell to find the right mutation. And it could do so more effectively mechanics that allowed all of the possible breadth of types of mutations to be explored simultaneously. It's kind of like if you're uh, going to work going one way, one route or another route or a third route, quantum mechanics allows you to try out all three routes at the same time and then decide, hey, this, this middle route seems to be the best one. And we thought that uh, cells were at a molecular level. Their DNA molecule was able to try out several mutations simultaneously and only the one that allowed the cell to grow left descendants. So it was kind of a way of, of uh, a natural selection becoming more effective at a molecular level with quantum mechanics. So we, that's what that's essentially the the, uh, um, the the idea that we put forward in the paper. It's a I can see how this begins to walk you and open up more questions. Discovering something at the end of that. What questions posed at the end of that that led you to continue the research there? Well, um, the question was really whether DNA could do this. Could it uh, behave we, uh, in this way? Now, we know that, um, say, an electron could do this. You can show with experiments that have been done by many physicists uh, uh, all over the world, you can show that electrons can be in two places at the same time. Oh, okay, my, my, my mind kind of, all right, I blew, my mind blew a little bit there. So you, you got to walk me back through <laughs> appearing okay. in two places at the same time, electrons, including the bacteria. I'm trying, I'm trying to catch up. Okay. Well, electrons are fundamental particle, tiny, tiny little particle, part of an atom. So they're very small. So we have trillions of them inside uh, our bodies. So we're talking about single electrons, but they're the kind of things that physicists can work with. They fire, uh, fire electrons from kind of electron guns. And if you fire them from electron guns, you can make them go through holes. The point is that when you fire electrons from electron guns, they can go through two separated holes at the same time. Single electrons. Now, if you find that puzzling, that's your mind is in the right place. No one really understands this. Okay, thank so God. <laughs> All right, thank God, because I'm going... There's no kind of... Ooh, Oh, that suddenly makes sense. No, it doesn't. Uh, um, Richard Feynman, a very famous quantum physicist, says, if you think you understand quantum, just do quantum mechanics. So it's not that there is a solution to this. It's just that quantum mechanics is weird. And what it tells you is that the world that we see around us at the level of fundamental particles is a lot weirder than we think it is. And in, in general, really it would have world. a lot more effect on us, correct? If it, there may be this microscopic world we can understand on how it interacts with our own living bodies and our own living cells being particles, etc., that we may not see or understand its own influence, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It's not that it interacts with us. It is our own living body. It, it our own us. living bodies are our are, are, are DNA. And when we look at... Uh, um, into somebody's eyes, for example, you see the color blue, the color green, the color brown. That color has been caused by a single molecule inside the cell that was inherited from either your mother or your father. A single molecule is a quantum mechanical entity. So you're seeing quantum mechanics at large when you look at living organisms. And that's different from everything else that you see. When you see a block of wood, dead wood, um, it's just, it's, you know, seeing something that's caused by lots of trillions of particles. 
uh, when you see storms and all sorts of uh, inanimate phenomena that are caused by trillions of particles. Organisms, you are seeing stuff that could be caused by a single molecule. The position of a single proton in a single DNA molecule could cause the difference between life and death in someone. So life is kind of uniquely poised on the small numbers of particles that makes life a particularly quantum mechanical phenomena. And that was our realization that we took on from, from um, uh, writing the paper. And then I went on to write this uh, book, Quantum Evolution, where I made a broader claim for quantum mechanics being fundamental to life. What, can you walk and me through walk me through that evolution, if you will forgive the pun, but walk me through the evolution into that book and uh, yeah. I like to connect I like to connect the books, right? The the train of thought and research along the way. Okay, well, the book came from um, just uh, thinking about uh, um, taking the ideas that we put into that paper and taking them further and expanding them and thinking, wow, this is kind of very weird and very strange and it's a different way to looking at life compared to how we normally uh, look at life and it could provide different kind of answers to some fundamental questions like what is life um how does it work and i thought this is so interesting i've got to write a book about it so i put, wrote a book proposal and got a, a, a publisher interested in commissioned me to write the book and uh, and that was then published in 2000, Quantum Evolution. So there I made a kind of general case for life being fundamentally based on quantum mechanics and that these peculiar mutations that we uh, found, uh, or that John Cairns found and we uh, uh, wrote the paper about, uh, could be uh, some, some part of, of what uh, is going on in evolution, that sometimes some mutations may be, caught, <clears throat> may be occurring more frequently than um, than they would otherwise because of this their peculiar quantum mechanical uh, property of DNA that DNA is a quantum mechanical not a classical entity as we call it classical entities are like um, balls um, uh, houses the stuff that behave the usual like the usual uh, according to the usual rule book that we're we're used to where particles where cannonballs, footballs, etc. place and not another. They don't do weird things like passing through impenetrable barriers. That's the classical world. It's a world we're used to, but at the molecular level, it's a different world, a different group that allows uh, particles to do things like being in multiple places at the same time, passing through impenetrable barriers, spookily connected to other particles uh, that may be separated by entire galaxies and all this weird stuff goes on at the level that we can't see, but it's still going on. So uh, that first book was kind of exploring that uh, and the implications of that um, realization that uh, uh, quantum mechanics lies at the hidden core of life. Um, yeah, so that was um, uh, back in 2000. And, um, I ha and then the area went quiet, really, that um, both uh, uh, Jim and I uh, carried on working on our, if you like, our, our paid work, me working on tuberculosis, meningitis, that kind of stuff. Jim working on particle physics. And we carried on meeting up every now and again to explore quantum biology. But it's such a, it was such a speculative area. We did try to get some funding for doing some projects in this area, but mostly we were shot down in flames by reviewers saying this is total nonsense. This is uh, it's too speculative. You can't uh, give money to these guys. They're mad. But uh, so we 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 kind of still pursued it, but not in a productive way in terms of uh, getting any any funding for um, any. What were some of the studies? What were some of the studies you wanted to do? What were some of the proposals you put forth that you wanted to look into? Uh, well, we wanted to look into DNA and finding out if we could detect uh, uh, quantum superposition, as it's called, this ability for particles to be in multiple places at the same time in DNA, whether it really was involved in mutation. Um, theoretical studies, I wanted to do experimental work, but um, uh, and also looking at whether it was involved in other phenomena, like in enzymes and, uh, and in uh, uh, how they work. 
um, whether it was involved in protein folding, lots of ideas for where quantum mechanics, the weird stuff in the quantum rule book might be involved in life. Uh, but really well received, particularly by the biological communities, kind of uh, not surprisingly in a way, because whereas physicists were kind of used to quantum mechanics, they knew that the world was real when you really looked down deep and hard at, uh, at the particles inside uh, atoms and stuff, they knew that, yeah, they obeyed this other rule book. So they kind of, yeah, okay, that, that makes sense that that's going to have consequences because DNA is a single molecule. Um, and so are proteins. Uh, but the biologist, when you tell, uh, when I gave talks in uh, biology circles and said, well, you know, maybe this particle can be in two places or 200 places at once, they'd say, not in my cells, it can't. You know, they're not used to the rule book. They've only been trained in the classical rule book, which says, no, particles have to be here or there. They're not both here and there at the same time. So it got more of a skeptical. Um, like from uh, the biology, biological uh, community, um, and uh, so uh, uh, obviously not able to uh, uh, pursue. You can't really do science without a budget, and uh, we carried on pursuing the science that people would keep us um, keep us in, in in good employment with. Um, Jim doing his particle physics, me doing my um, um, uh, molecular genetics of uh, bacterial pathogens, and. And everything kind well, of you see, went on for. Well, what what caused to arise? You see more of it being questioned. You see quantum mechanics coming up a lot. Uh, you're seeing almost that rise of it. When did it begin to emerge again? And and how did that bring yeah. back more more of your work? It it started to emerge in the uh, uh, about a decade later. Really, uh, there were a number of in, very interesting experiments being done. Uh, for example, in California, um, there was uh, experiments being done by a chap called Greg Engel in Graham Fleming's lab at the University of California. And they were looking at uh, photosynthesis. Uh, photosynthesis, I'm sure you and your readers are familiar with. It's uh, stuff that makes uh, plants green and gives us all our food. <laughs> it's essentially all down to photosynthesis in the end because the plants uh, capture light energy to turn it into into plants and um, then we either eat the plants or we eat animals like cows that eat the plants so all the biomass on our planet is made by photosynthesis the puzzle um, at the front end of photosynthesis the capture of the light energy um, light is uh, can be described as coming in particles called photons so when a photon hits a leaf of a plant it's captured and then the energy has to be transported from one place to another. It's a first step of photosynthesis, the many subsequent steps, but, but the first step is a transport reaction. You have to take energy and move it from one place to another. Now, the way that that was understood was the energy kind of hops from one place to another, rather like you might imagine uh, hopping over a, a stream uh, by jumping from one stone to another. The problem with that is, for the energy transport and photosynthesis, there are too many stones. There's lots of chlorophyll molecules are what capture the energy and what uh, the energy hops onto. It hops onto more chlorophyll molecules, and they're all kind of like stones in a stream. But it's a big stream, and there are lots of stones, and the energy shouldn't really know where to go. So mostly, the energy should get let should get lost. It should two or three stones, and then the energy should kind of evaporate. But that doesn't happen. That energy transport in photosynthesis is the most efficient energy transport process we know of. It's in, under optimal conditions, it's 100% more or less, but as close as you can measure to 100%. So all of the energy under optimal conditions is captured. And it's not really, wasn't really clear how that happened. So in Graham's Fleming's lab, they were this phenomenon of energy transport by um, a process called two um, two dimensional femtosecond spectroscopy. And basically, what they do is they shine a laser light at the photosystem, that's the bit of the plant that does this trick, shine a laser light, very short flash of light at the system, and then they watch 
the light being reflected back. It's absorbed by the system and then it kind of gets reflected out of it. And what they expected was to see a kind of just a general loss of energy from the system. It would dribble out. What they found is the energy came out in waves, what they called quantum beats. And those uh, um, quantum beats are uh, what we um, know to be caused by quantum mechanical processes. So the energy wasn't coming out of the, um, wasn't being transported by hopping from one stone to the other. It was hopping on all stones simultaneously. Uh, it wasn't um, going classically around the uh, photosystem. It was traveling by all routes simultaneously by what's called a quantum warp. So if we go back to our thinking of, of uh, uh, you know, trying to get home by the quickest route, you try one route, you try another. If you're a quantum mechanical entity, you can try all routes. And that's how the uh, photosystem manages to be so efficient, the tra energy transport. It goes by all routes simultaneously and kind of collapses down on the most efficient, the quickest, the shortest path. And that's how it knows which way to go. So that was published in, I think it was General Nature or Science, but one of the, one of the most uh, high impact and most uh, 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 important journals in science and uh, made a big impact. Hey, this is, this is the stuff that turns uh, uh, light into grass, into trees, into bananas and tomatoes and everything else. And it's got quantum mechanics at its core. So people started to say, hmm, maybe there is something in this idea that quantum mechanics may be fundamental to life. Uh, and around about the same time, there are other studies coming out showing that enzymes, for example, enzymes after us, you know, after we eat our food, the food is turned into us. And it's done so by enzymes and what was found by uh, Judith Klinman again in California, actually, and um, by other uh, researchers like Nigel Scruton in the, in the UK, was that enzymes managed to do this trick of helping to make us by making some particles disappear from one point in space and appear at another point in space without visiting any of the, any of the in-between places. So pop, goes from here, pop, appears here. And this seems to be how many enzymes work. They make this uh, process of quantum tunneling happen to electrons and protons, and that process helps to keep us alive. So that was another demonstration around the time. And then probably the most famous kind of quantum biology uh, uh, proposal was that uh, birds use uh, another weird quantum feature to navigate around the world. Um, it's like the European robin, they're able to detect the Earth's magnetic field. And that's a bit of a puzzle because it's very weak. You know, if you think about using a, a compass to detect the Earth's magnetic field, you use a, uh, a needle suspended on a very frictionless uh, disc and it can kind of spin. That's because the Earth's magnetic field is very weak and it can't do very much. It doesn't move things unless they're very light, very small and uh, frictionless. And um, and yet birds can detect it. How do they do it? Do they have compasses? Uh, well, yes, they do. They have a compass and it's a weird compass because it uses light. And what um, um, a, another researcher called Thurston Rich Ritz proposed was that um, uh, the birds use light and another peculiar feature of quantum mechanics called quantum entanglement. Now, quantum entanglement allows you to take two quantum particles, one here, one here, say, and they start off together and then they separate. They're separated, they're not really separated. Quantum mechanically, they're still the same particle, they're still kind of stuck together in a weird way. And they can get separated to the ends of the galaxy and they will still have some kind of spooky connection. So if you do something to one of them, and if you do something to this one, this one will hop. So these kind of connections are um, very strange and weird. And even, you know, I, Albert Einstein, this, this, Albert Einstein was one of the scientists who helped to create quantum mechanics. And he made, gave us black holes and warped space time. And he, 
he couldn't take this. He said, this is too weird. This, I, I don't believe this. It's, and he called it spooky action at a distance. So it's so weird that even Ein, Albert Einstein, who gave us black holes and space time, and um, uh, he, he, he thought, no, this is, go, this is too far. This is too weird. So, um, um, but uh, it definitely happens. It's uh, lots of experiments have demonstrated quantum entanglement. And what Thurston Ritz proposed was that it was responsible for the uh, bird's magnetic compass. It was just a proposal, a, because of the structure of the theory, a prediction. And that is that the compass should be disrupted, disrupted by high frequency radio waves. So we got together with a couple of ornithologists and tested this out and demonstrated that yes, indeed disrupted by high frequency radio waves. So it, um, it was another demonstration that uh, quantum mechanics seems to be um, involved in yet another feature of life uh, that, um, that makes life work. And um, so suddenly, quantum the idea that quantum mechanics might be in, involved in biology has uh, turned fairly rapidly from a sign of madness to a sign of maybe just vague eccentricity being interested in, in uh, um, quantum biology. And now you, we have conferences in quantum biology in which serious scientists that uh, go along and, and we have researchers around, around the world who, who probe the quantum mechanical uh, properties of biomolecules and try to discover how they work. And it's of huge interest outside of even biology because the fact that it's going on inside um, living systems is really interesting and really unexpected because really they should be too big, too complicated, too hot for quantum mechanics to survive inside uh, living cells. It normally takes, um, when, when physicists try to detect these effects like entanglement or superposition, they they take systems, very simple systems, an atom or two or three atoms, and they cool them down to absolute zero or as close as they can get to absolute zero temperature, which is minus 273 degrees centigrade. And they perform their experiments in a vacuum and they perform them on tables, which are uh, elevated on, on a kind of hovercraft uh, tables that, uh, um, so they don't get any vibrations from anything going on in the, in the surrounding building. And then they can detect these phenomena, but it's hard and it's, uh, uh, and it's very difficult to detect these phenomena. And you have to do the experiments very carefully. And yet they seem to be going on in green leaves, in trees. So uh, scientists who are interested in developing technologies based on things like entanglement and superposition, and they're kind of wondering, well, what, what if I could do these kind of experiments out there in the amongst the trees in the forest, then it would make technologies that could revolutionize science, like quantum computers. Quantum computers are a technology that people are trying to invent because they, uh, they are computers that would work using this weird quantum world. And if anyone can make them, um, or at least make quantum computers of sufficient power, then they would be of enormous power. A quantum computer uh, the size of your laptop could outperform a conventional computer the size of the entire universe. So these are pretty powerful computers if anyone can make them. But well, it seems like you, you, mentioned, kind of... you mentioned a few things. We're we're probably the only species that makes things that destroys itself and continues to go. Let's keep expanding technology, even though we're not sure about all of it. And I'm seeing kind of a link, right? You're talking about nature, being able to study in nature. I'm seeing the idea of light having an influence on our development, who we are. I mean, come on, we all go outside, we go camping for a weekend, right? We come back we're like, oh, I'm better. So I, you feel better, but I see the light being connected. Uh, the more discoveries on a mo molecular level that we're discovering is, is amazing to me. But <laughs> the idea is almost infinite still, right? Yeah, there's a huge amount of stuff that we don't know about what's going on in quantum biology and its implications for biology, never mind for other technologies. So yeah, there's a huge, a huge and um, um, and exciting world out there of quantum biology that we still need to know about. Yeah, yeah, that that 
new discovery, the, the new knowledge of how we are impacted. It seems that if on a molecular level, we're, can, we're finding discoveries of connection, entanglement across, uh, it, would hard, it would be hard to be pressed not to assume that we are connected, being made of electrons, protons, et cetera, that us as individuals somehow aren't entangled in this energy or magnetic world of whatever, right? A lot of people describe it as things, as the energy in the world, or there's a vibe, right? But it seems like it, it, you're almost studying something like that. That's almost revealing the vibe or the energy or something like that. And not really. <laughs> the, re the reason is that um, uh, although you know this uh, quantum entanglement, as as I described, it's really hard to demonstrate it even with two electrons separated by. I can, say, I can barely grasp it. So the really, idea, I can barely it's grasp it. It's a really big deal. Um, and uh, uh, the kind of things that's going on in quantum biology, the kind of things, this entanglement and this tunneling is going on within single cells. So, you know, maybe within one DNA molecule, you'll have a, a particle hopping from one place to another, or in one enzyme molecule, you'll hop from one place to another. So the connections are very local inside living cells. I'm not entangled with you or anyone else by that process so the kind of things that people talk about energy and entangle i will all entangle with it or maybe we are but that isn't what i'm talking about the kind of stuff i'm talking about far it jumps from one molecule to another maybe and with a great deal of, but it doesn't jump from one person to another so it's a different kind of uh, entanglement you're talking about there and who knows whether that's uh, for real but the kind, it's not the kind of stuff that people are study, studying in quantum, in quantum biology. Well, I figure a lot of times, I definitely understand that's not what you're explaining, but for me, I, I tend to be this abstract thinker of an optimistic, hopeful idea. And sometimes, right, I, you look for theories to shoot facts in reverse. And Yeah, yeah. I mean, everything, uh, uh, you know, general re relativity became a big surprise to everyone. Everyone thought, hey, we know how the world works. And then Einstein came along and said, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> and similarly, quantum mechanics uh, came as a big surprise to everyone. And uh, Can, could you do me a favor? Well. Uh, could you reference, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I meant, I meant to do it earlier, but kind of give a brief overview for those that aren't uh, deeply entrenched in the idea of quantum mechanics. Kind of, you know, when you're mentioning that as you're explaining your research and books, kind of, uh, I know it's difficult to give an overview, if you will, but kind of uh, what, you're, what you're meaning by saying quantum mechanics involvement in life and in different areas. Okay, well, first of all, is quantum mechanics. It's the way that um, fundamental matter, atoms, electrons, particles, protons, all this kind of stuff, uh, behave. And uh, they behave differently from the stuff around us. So as I was saying earlier, that Electrons can be in two places at once. They can be have these spooky connections. They can even travel through uh, impenetrable barriers. They can disappear from one place and appear in another place. So this is what quantum mechanics is. But you must remember that it's the reason why the world appears different is because quantum mechanics is normally confined to the very, very small, the atoms the molecules. What is interesting about life is that living cells depend on the very, very small. DNA is a single molecule. And the position of protons, for example, in the DNA double helix determines the shape of your nose. So life is uniquely quantum mechanical stuff. So that's really the message of quantum biology that there's another kind of science that people aren't aware of that allows these weird things to happen level it doesn't allow them to happen in your kitchen thank you and can you connect your your latest book the life on the edge and how human evolution or human uh, molecular biology everything you've been studying all up to now has led up to the book that you've put out now right life on the edge yeah, so life. So as as I was saying, um, uh, Jim and I went to, uh, after uh, writing our paper, and uh, I wrote uh, my book uh, Quantum Evolution back in two thousand. Everything kind of went quiet, and then in in the two thousands, uh, these papers came out. Ooh, bang! Really interesting papers on quantum mechanics in photosynthesis, quantum mechanics in enzymes, quantum mechanics in in um, 
in a bird navigation, quantum mechanics, even in our sense of smell. So we thought, wow, this this is this is something we need to write about. And by then, uh, Jim was also uh, writing popular science books, and I was writing popular science books. So we thought, well, let's get together and write a book about quantum biology. So we did, and uh, over a period of probably about two years, we, we put together this uh, book, uh, Life on the Edge, which takes um, uh, biology and goes into all of those stories about birds navigating around the globe and um, and uh, the science of uh, that makes people think that uh, that's a quantum mechanical phenomenon that the compass depends on the weird quantum world similarly for photosynthesis I have a chapter on how we think photosynthesis is uh, uh, is based on quantum mechanical stuff in the sense of smell and mutation of course which is particularly interesting to us we're still uh, pursuing that uh, so how quantum mechanics may be involved in mutation and if it's involved in mutation it's also involved in evolution because mutation is the driver for evolution so uh, and we also have a, have a, a chapter on consciousness and uh, as you may know there's been a lot of interest in whether consciousness is a, a quantum mechanical phenomenon um, and, uh, and that's been uh, proposed uh, most famously by uh, the mathematician Roger Penrose and uh, his colleague Stuart Hammerhoff, uh, an anesthetist, and they've been proposing for some time that uh, consciousness is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. That as well, and we explore maybe that the origin of life might be might have depended on a uh, weird quantum world, and uh, go on to um, um, look at. Um, uh, what the implications of all this in maybe there's a new kind of technology ahead of us that could use all this uh, um, understanding of life uh, to perhaps even make new forms of life to uh, uh, do uh, synthetic biology to make life from chemicals something that's never been achieved really despite the fact that we have this discipline called synthetic biology it isn't really synthetic biology no one ha can make a living organism from anything other than other living organisms. But maybe our new understanding of quantum biology will allow us to do that. So that's a kind of speculation into the future. Uh, and uh, if it could, it could allow us to develop new and revolutionary uh, technologies that could transform our world, hopefully in only good ways. Wow. Well, the questions that have evolved over, what, a decade of you writing, of where it has begun, of questioning the evolution, all the way up to now the possibilities uh, of what we could discover on, on those levels. Thank you for your work. It's a pleasure to talk about it. Well, it seems in, that last, in this last book that you're trying, you're almost providing answers to some older questions, but then bringing up new questions on this level. What are some of the latest big questions that have been answered in this study and kind of the new ones that have been producing other than, you know, we can't make life from dead, which I think is, uh, I don't yeah. know, should we even do that? My gosh. Right? It's a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a big question whether we want to make life from scratch. And many people would say playing God. Other people would say, well, if we could do something useful with it, like, uh, you know, help to cure... Uh, uh, world hunger, then you know maybe it's not such a bad idea. But you know that's a question for for society, not for scientists. Scientists will explore whether it's possible, but it'll be up to society to decide uh, um, whether you want to do it. But the big question in in quantum biology probably at the moment is how does it work? Um, uh, we wouldn't really expect quantum biology to happen to survive inside uh, hot hot and very uh, busy living cells um, because of living cells are full of stuff vibrating very fast and that's meant to destroy the delicate states of quantum biology. Life seems to have this rather peculiar and remarkable ability to utilize all the randomness, kind of like a storm in, in blowing the sails of a ship to actually drive life. And this is we think is what is special about life, that the randomness that would otherwise destroy quantum states inside inanimate stuff actually helps to maintain quantum mechanics inside living cells and we think that's the really key feature of life oh so the trials are necessary the pushback from our environment from our moments our situations are truly what make us evolve and grow possibly is what we're pondering right now yes holy shit man <laughs> 
Yeah, that's a beautiful place to end this, if you don't mind. That uh, yeah, no, that's a good place. Yeah, I don't think I don't think my brain works anymore right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as as uh, um, Feynman said, if you understand, I think you understand quantum mechanics, then you've not understood quantum mechanics. So, if you're feeling puzzled, that's the right way to be <laughs> at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you coming on because I'm uh, quite puzzled and I appreciate those like yourself uh, and Jim that can keep your minds, if you will, in a place of questioning and unknown and walking through that and still keeping sane and uh, holding it together. And really, it seems like one of the last frontiers, the galaxies and space, the deep oceans and the molecular level seems to be the frontiers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Understanding what life is really all about is, I think, still the most exciting question in science. So. It's one we hope to be able to uh, crack. Well, I appreciate you being a scientist actually pursuing that question uh, beyond the philosophical approaches to it. So thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Good to talk I, to you. I appreciate you. Come back on again when we get some more research and other big questions to be answered or, or once they get answered. I'd love to. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'd love to. I'll open invitation anytime. Thank you again for doing the show. Thank you. Good talking. You. Take care. Bye-bye. My God, my mind stopped working at the end, y'all. Literally, with the connection at the end of, uh, you know, all of the hype and counselors and coaches, and everything you see where people are talking about appreciate your darkness. I say that all the time, but it's you know appreciating the pushback that maybe without it we wouldn't grow, right? Without the uh, need to evolve, to create, to connect, to fix, to share, to help. Uh, to invent without that possibly we don't grow is what they seem to be asking now what was what they are asking on that level of science but it seems to be that's where it's pointing that there's uh, a need for all of the shit that happens to us and I guess maybe that old adage is right that uh, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger thanks for listening y'all